Yeah. The longer, the better. The reality is, but most people don't want to lay another feet up for that long. You know, if you're if you're reading a book or talking on the phone or watching television or whatever, you know what? You're awake. Use that time. You know, don't sit there with your feet down below collecting more fluid. Um, now, there's a big push as well for nighttime frequency, and there are medicines that are out there now, nasal sprays. I'm not sure if you guys have seen the ads for that or not. The raccoon has the garbage can with its veins together. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, but that's there. You know, this is nothing new. We did this about 15 years ago, and we gave a few people strokes, and we stopped doing it about 15 years ago, and now we're back to the same thing again. So it's kind of interesting how it's come full cycle, and you, know, you got to love how medicine goes and, and you know redoes things we've done in the past. Uh, hopefully, it will stay for this time. A uh, very selective person that can get that drug though can't have any cardiac disease, no heart disease. Uh, shouldn't be on water pills, and you got to get your your sodium, your salt level, and your blood checked fairly frequently because that's what happens: is you take that pill and you don't get rid of your or that spray, you don't get rid of your fluid, and then you start retaining fluid. And more free water means that your salt level drops, and then it drops too low, and then you get a stroke in your pons, and then you realize that peeing and that wasn't as bad as that. Yes. Kegels uh, for yeah. you know. One pound a day, one yeah. to two pounds yeah. a day, effective? They, they sure can be, yeah. So the more body awareness you have in low volume clients, the better you're going to do. Um, if you do a pelvic floor physical therapist, the great benefit is they hold you accountable. Right. So that, that's where they see the difference. So if you do a study and you say, okay, I'm going to teach people how to do kegels and send them out on their own, or I'm going to send them to the pelvic floor physical therapist, the one that got sent out on their own, they did it for a week and they stopped. The person that saw the physical therapist was doing them all the time because they knew that they were going to see whoever the physical therapist was and they were going to mock them because they didn't do anything. Well, you've made zero progress this week, sir. And um, you're not aware of anybody in the private sector that does it? I'm not. We have one that's embedded in our, our clinic, so I'm sorry. I, I don't know who does it on that outside. There's got to be people. I mean, just we, we can give you names. Um, yes? Kind of a different question, but... Sure. Being in the military and the armed forces, mm -hmm. in medical care, I mean, their job is to have a fighting man. How long do they let somebody have surgery, recoup, and all that before they get them out of there? So, uh, what have you noticed? Great, great question. Um, my patient population is usually not active duty. <laughs> They're usually beneficiaries who have retired. Oh, okay. So if you serve 20 years, you get military health care for life. This has been the, the deal. Now that may change in the next... 12 months, I don't know. We just got taken over by DHA. So a new Department of Health Administration now runs military hospitals. The Department of Defense no longer owns me. So that, that happened this year. It's rolled out in Washington, D.C., and it's coming this way. So it hasn't hit Madigan yet. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of talk that we may not be in the service at all in, in five years. I don't know. Yeah. And that, but that's, you know, who, my average patient age in my clinic, where I get skewed by seeing the active duty guy that's got a kidney stone or they're dependent or what have you is 77. Wow. That's my average patient age, 77. So realize that urology is a, it, it's not, in my practice, it's not for the young people I'm seeing. I turn kidney stones and that's it. Or uh, in AUS, it is around skin years old. What are the first things that might go wrong with it? Is it where's up? So when it wears out, you'll notice if you're kind of in tune, you're pumping more often. So instead of, well, I used to pump twice and it felt like it would go flat. Now I'm pumping three times, I'm pumping four times. So that, that's that subcuff atrophy where that urethra gets small. But more often than not, it's like I'm just leaking more. My leakage went from one pad a day to two pads a day to three pads a day to, I don't know that it's doing anything. And then if I pump it, it just stays flat, which means you got to leak somewhere. And it just needs to go. I mean, it, it, when they get to that point, they're so in tune with their sphincter that it's like, you know, it's part of them, uh, bionic man type thing, and you know when it's not there. It, it really, it's like, stop, it's time. And that'll happen. They'll say, you know, I'm leaking a little more. I'll say, oh, let's take a look at it. I'm like, yeah, how bad are you? You know, you know, when do you want me to operate on you again? And I kind of put it in their lap and say, you know what, each time we do this, we run a risk. The infection rate on the revision is higher than on the primary. And we only have so many spots in your urethra where we really get a good implant. Because um, you can put it back the same spot. It's nice to kind of move it a little bit, though, one way or the other. Um, and, you know, if you're like, yeah, I'm okay. I'm at two pads and it's not driving me nuts. And I know when I didn't have it, I was at six pads. Yeah, 
Wait a little bit. It's fun. If you're like, I hate these two pads, Doc. I'm ready to get it done now. It's been 10 years. Okay, that's your choice, too. You know, this is a quality of life thing. If your quality of life is miserable, then we, we operate a little bit sooner. Um, but it, it's driven by, driven by you. It's not driven by me. There's no hard line in the sand. Like, oh, you have to have it done. Because guess what? The fail is incontinence and diapers. And you can wait till it's totally dead, and we can fix it two years later if you want. You know, it's not like we, we lost anything by doing that. If you have an erosion, that's usually blood in the urine. Someone put a catheter in you, and then we need to look and see it. And that, that's the case where it's eroded, it just seems to come out. And that's not like, oh my goodness, has to happen right now. That's usually, you know, get on antibiotics, get on schedule in a couple days type thing. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, I got an old question. Sure. When I had my prostatectomy, uh -huh. they put a catheter in me. Yeah. And then within seven days, the food would take it out. Yeah. Well, Mine was in for 21 days. Okay. And Why? It leaked the whole time because it couldn't schedule me in. Okay. And you leaked around the catheter? Yeah. Okay. How is that possible? It's supposed to be plugged yeah. up. Great question. It's not a plug. No. So the, the catheter they put in on average is probably about half the size of your urethra. Right down here. So real common for right anybody, say say you just had you know a catheter in, you didn't have prostate surgery, and you have a catheter in, and it's super common for people to sit down on the toilet and go to poop and they'll pee around the catheter. So we tell you not to try and do that, but what's healing? What's healing? It, exactly right. Well, it heals because you're diverting most of that urine away. Okay? So if you're leaking around it, which will happen when the bladder squeezes inappropriately, then you know you don't want that obviously because if it's happening all the time, it may not heal as well and more urine may leak out the side. Did they do an x-ray to see if it healed or did they just say a three weeks you're good? No. Three weeks usually you're good. Right? Sweat it out. Yeah. Okay. Well, that was the biggest explosion I ever experienced in my life. What do you mean by explosion? Seven, nine. Okay. Oh, so they filled you up, pulled it out, and then you gave you. One, two. Yeah. 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 Catheter for three weeks, though, isn't horrible. <laughs> you know, if we do a, a urethroplasty, well, I know, but if, I'm just saying, if we do a urethroplasty, it's very true. <laughs> we'll, play. Uh, we'll do a urethroplasty for four, four weeks, though. And it just because we say we have to do, you know, use the inside of your cheeks to do something to your urethra. Not uncommon to have a catheter for four weeks while it's in there. Wow. Yeah. But hey, if they're peeing afterwards, it's pretty good. <laughs> One more. Sure. Last question. You, you said something about the, the body doesn't know the difference between the two sphincters. I mean, the anal sphincter and the uh, fetal sphincter. So I said the body has a hard time telling the difference between a full rectum and a full bladder. That's, that's, yeah. that's what you said. Okay. Yeah. That's fine. I'm wondering then, isn't there, uh, an, even by experience, that regularity is pretty important to being able to control your, uh, your urination? Are we talking about regularity in voiding or in pooping? Yeah, in voiding, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I don't know what you... What, Say those two regularities. So we're talking about number one or number two? Two. Uh, yeah. Regularity number two? I mean, we haven't talked about but that yeah. does affect. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, and the sooner that everybody kind of learns that your bowel habits control your bladder, the happier you're going to be. And yeah. you think about, you know, when you were in utero and you're being formed, you have a common channel, and they call it a cloaca, which is a Latin word for sewer. Right, nice word, um, because it's, it's stool and urine together, and the, the rectum separates and goes backwards, and the bladder separates and goes so forwards. The pressure is going but, both directions. But the nerve root is the same nerve root. Oh. So it, it's innervated like this, it separates, but it's still innervated the same way. And someone who's chronically constipated pays the price with urgency frequency. Um, yeah, so when we see this from this high all the way up, and, you know, dysfunctional voiders, our pediatric urology colleagues, have, you know, like a continuous strip of Miralax to get little kids to poop appropriately because it causes their incontinence during the day because they're not pooping well. Um, and it doesn't change. You know, as we age, we still have that same problem. And, you know, fiber and water are, are your friends, and you got to be pooping every day, and it's got to be, like, soft ice cream consistency. And if it's not, you're probably somewhere on that spectrum of constipation. So part of the control system, I mean, that we would use is to try to make sure that that, too, is uh, yeah. effective. Yeah, without a doubt. Because it will affect the other. Without a doubt. Thank you. Now, pure stress urinary incontinence, post-prostatectomy incontinence, probably not so much. 
probably doesn't, you know, but it, it really drives that urge. If you have an urge component at all, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Hope I didn't get too dry, but uh, no, I enjoyed no, my time. No. Oh, thank you. Thank you, you Norm. One, one more comment on my name. Sure. Thank you, Don, for thank you. Thank you, Don. Yes. Oh, yeah. This is Don.